we have uh, all these studies, uh, presentations, mystery cases are being posted at cardiaccarecritique.com. So uh, if you um, happen to miss a conference or want to catch something you may have missed before, cardiaccarecritique.com. We're posting uh, these conferences as well as cardio-oncology, which are conferences that occur once a month for the International Cardio-Oncology Society of North America. And then coronary anomaly conferences are being posted there as well if you have an interest in coronary anomalies. We're going to start on today's case. We're looking for Pu from Eastern Tennessee State University. She hasn't come up yet, but she's going to be participating some. And uh, hopefully we can get Largo uh, to unmute uh, so they can talk to us. So our first case is a 70-year-old male media executive who uh, basically actually went on with an appointment in Washington uh, with the Obama administration. This gentleman uh, had a, a stress echocardiogram. He has uh, advised that he has significant aortic stenosis that may be worsening from the doctors he's been seeing. And uh, he just moved to Tampa at this time. This was uh, back in, I think, 2006. And he was having shortness of breath when he walks up a flight of stairs, works out, or takes the garbage out. But he didn't have any other symptoms. And so let's see what we can make about him. And so we have some echo parameters. This is uh, 2005 and 2007. It's really interesting to compare echocardiograms on people. And... Uh, within uh, short periods of time. And there's huge variability. The variability is so great that in cardio-oncology clinic, we have such a high standard. We require that if there's a 5 or 10 percent variation, that you make certain changes in terms of whether you continue with chemotherapy or whether you introduce a beta blocker or an ACE. And uh, with routine echocardiography, going to the lowest bidder, those changes are not valid because the changes you see on the echocardiogram with the ejection fraction are so highly variable and they seem to be pretty inaccurate. And so in one place, the lowest bidder may be uh, an outpatient radiology center where they, there's a tech that does ultrasound on gallbladders and stuff, and occasionally she'll do a heart and then a cardiologist would come by at the end of the day and read it, and so it's not a supervised tech, and it's not a registered cardiac tech, and so their echoes are so different uh, from a place like that, and then other places where they have panel people that rotate through, and you don't know if the tech's a student or a new tech, and so we have tremendous variability, and you can't, you can't really manage patients who have breast cancer, for example, who's chemotherapy, maybe adriamycin, and they may get Herceptin, Tuzumab, and those patients then are being managed on the basis of their echocardiogram, and you just can't do it. You've got to have, you know, a firmly based echo, same tech, same machine, best machine, and uh, also incorporate strain echo, which is, uh, shows changes prior to the changes that you see with uh, 2D echo in terms of wall motion. And it's more of a mechan mechanistic, mechanistic type changes that you see in the wall from speckle tracking. So anyway, we've got this highly variability, not surprising, might be some LVH, may, may be borderline LVH, maybe there's a gradient, maybe there wasn't a gradient, now there's a gradient, <laughs> there's a valve area, doesn't look like a valve area, ejection fraction, well we're not sure, and maybe a leaky valve may not be a leaky valve, and so no big deal. I mean, certainly you're not going to make or break it case, is it? Well, it certainly produces negative economic value. <laughs> yeah, and so, so we found that with cardio-oncology, and we just couldn't deal with it. And so we, we met with the oncologist and said, hey, we'll have one echo machine, one echo tech. We'll get the best machine in the world. We got shipped in. List price, $280,000 $280, from Norway with speckle tracking, 4D, all the bells and whistles. We got a tech who's been a tech teaching for 20 years, and we said, here we go. 
we're going to we're going to have some standardization and that's what we did so and also we we actually sent the tech elsewhere to learn strain and come back with uh, from MD Anderson with a great knowledge of how to do strain so back to the history this part of the history that hypertension is important because we measure aortic stenosis in terms of gradient and also in terms of production of left ventricular hypertrophy if the wall is pumping against a higher resistance then any muscle is going to get bigger and the heart's no exception and so you get left ventricular hypertrophy from hypertension because of distal peripheral vascular resistance systemically and you get also because of basically pumping against a stenosis and so hypertension is going to be very important in differentiating you know what we're dealing with here in terms of left ventricular hypertrophy the parasophageal hiatal hernia well we can't shake that off either because if this guy is complaining as we saw of dyspnea on exertion uh, which he had here okay walks up a flight of stairs shortness of breath works out takes the garbage out shortness of breath well uh, basically a hernia parasophageal can be a space occupying lesion that's actually occupying space in the lung and causing some compromise in lung volume and so-called restrictive lung disease and so that can be just as important of course obesity is important in your exercise capability sleep apnea is important in your capability the next day an exercise test uh, is a subjective test and uh, it's basically how you feel that day and so it's a learned response and uh, it's first, first time out you don't do as well as you do the second time out and so all these things uh, have to be taken into consideration the melanoma removal from the nose no recurrence uh, probably uh, grade zero melanoma very common in Florida mother died at age 69 MI that's important diabetes in the family, lung cancer in the family, another MI in the family. So all this kind of stuff is going to be very important in evaluating this patient. Diavan and metoprolol, well that must be his treatment for hypertension. Certainly uh, there's no treatment for aortic stenosis. So let's take another look and see what else we find out about him. Well, SAO2 is normal, respiratory rate's normal, heart rate is 56, weighs on metoprolol, and uh, blood pressure 120 over 76. So adequately treated hypertension with uh, diavan and metoprolol. Otherwise, unremarkable. Well, there's no comment of the findings of aortic stenosis in terms of pulses, tardis, ad pavis, which means uh, a late and very short pulse in terms of the height or amplitude. No mention of systolic murmur. But of course, we do echocardiogram nowadays. So who needs physical examination? That's sort of gone by the wayside, and uh, the stethoscope is uh, more symbolic, right? Well, moving along here, here we have the two echoes, which are very difficult to compare. So now we got another echo. Well, look, we got a peak systolic gradient of 76 millimeters of mercury. Hmm. Well, that's pretty close to the 72, so uh, it's within a month, so that must be uh, the correct one. So then we throw all these numbers out. We come up with a 72. We don't know what's going on over here, so we're throwing that out. The aortic valve area obviously relies on several more variables than the peak systolic flow and the mean gradient across the valve, and so we can throw that out. And so we're over here. Well, the ejection fraction looks pretty good, 73%. Aortic valve area, 0.94. We put them on the treadmill. Nine minutes on the treadmill is pretty good with a guy who has some left ventricular hypertrophy and uh, no ischemic changes and so he did have LVH uh, maybe I'm not sure how much probably 14 13 or 14 so we found out something now what we're going through and discussing here is something called watchful waiting and uh, at the end of this presentation now that we seem to be moving into a severe aortic stenosis in this patient we'll have to ask ourselves you know uh, what value is watchful waiting and when do we wait for symptoms or when do we take action? And so let's move on, especially since we have TAVR, which is an action that may or may not be equal to or superior to 
until we get later in our discussion to cardiac surgery. And so what do we do next? And looks to me like we don't have a fellow to help us, and so let's just go look. Idea. Did I hear someone? Uh, cardiac MR produces spectacular images and good data. Oh, I like that. And so MR is going to be in this gentleman's future. And uh, I don't know if it's in his future right immediately, but it looks like we're following him with echocardiogram serially for a while. And uh, But MR is great, especially if you were in the first case here where they had so many question marks, the MR would be our thing of choice. But who was doing MR in 2005? Not a lot. Maybe uh, 50 universities in the country or something. And so let's go down here and see what we got on our next echo in 2008. Aortic valve area is roughly pretty much the same. The mean gradient, peak systolic gradient. Oh, we're getting some, well, I wonder how come we're getting some uh, consistent data. I wonder how come that is. Well, we got the same echo tech, we got the same machine, we got the same doctor. So it's no surprise that the data is consistent. So peak velocity is greater than 4, 4.37, you're starting to think, this is pretty significant aortic stenosis. The LVH is a little bit less this time, not sure why that is. Should be measurable, should be easy to be consistent with LVH. And now we've gone six months more, and this is what we used to do when we did watchful waiting. You can see that Within and every six months to get an echo, and you can see within six months, the aortic valve area might have gotten more. It looks like the peak systolic gradient, whoa, is 97, and the mean gradient across the valve is 59. The aortic valve area is getting down to what it was thought to be in 2005, so we have to say those numbers were wrong back then, and so because this is pretty consistent what we're seeing now, and so actually. Some people have reported a 15 millimeter of mercury gradient increase per year. And so subtracting 76 from 97, we get a 21 in six months. So a 15 millimeter gradient in a year was the average increase of the peak systolic gradient in a large study. So we've got left ventricular end diastolic diameter, diameter okay, we've got systolic diameter okay, we got left ventricular function is still holding pretty good and uh, the gradient has become pretty high at this point. So this is like a hundred millimeter gradient across the valve. Frequently we would take people to surgery on the basis of that alone. Let's see what we did with this gentleman. And let's explore watchful waiting. So watchful waiting was kind of, is a kind of a tense thing. Uh, and uh, because here we go with a 100 millimeter gradient, we're putting it out on the treadmill. This guy's a bull. He's on the treadmill. He's nine minutes again, okay, with a 100 millimeter gradient across his aortic valve. People would say, oh, my goodness, aren't you taking risk of sudden death? But uh, he says he's asymptomatic, uh, except for some shortness of breath he gets occasionally, which may be the parasophageal hernia that's a space-occupying lesion in his chest. And we'll explore that later when we look at his chest. So watchful waiting would say, hey, still waiting. Asymptomatic, severe aortic stenosis. Quite a surprise that he could do so well. Well, how objective is his self-reporting? And so this is a man on the treadmill. We're watching him. We've got him doing it right in front of us. And so, you know, with a lot of encouragement, uh, he's obese, uh, and he's trotting along. And he, he got to nine, min nine minutes, you know. Not, okay. not an extraordinary feat. We have a, a guy who, uh, who goes 12 minutes, actually 11 minutes, who's like 85 years old. And so, but he's, the guy is an athlete. We have athletes. I saw an athlete who ran a half marathon, who was 81 years old yesterday. And so this is not real good, according to if you look at the people who are extraordinary. But it's good for average citizen couch potato uh, sitting around Tampa. And so here we go. We got 
3D echo. Oh, we brought him over for 3D echo. So we're more interested in looking at the ejection fraction, which we didn't put down here, because 3D echo gives us a better ejection fraction, and which on his 3D echo was okay. Some people call it a 4D echo because of time. But anyway, we got a pretty good ejection fraction. It was normal. But look, we've got a gradient of 113 millimeters of mercury, and the guy still has his own valve in. That's pretty unusual to find, even in 2008, someone still has their valve, especially with the experience people have had down here in the south and with nonagenarians, octogenarians. We even put an aortic valve in a 105-year-old person uh, who uh, was one of our elite people who was a walkie-talkie and who drove to the hospital. And so, so we've had a lot of experience with elderly people getting aortic valve replacement with mortality rates in the 5% range for surgery, which uh, aren't the same that have been reported in the north at this time because of all these retirement people that would come down here to Florida, and we had the creme de la creme. Let's see what, what, what we found out next, and we'll skip next what to do, and we have some coronary CTA. So why would we do, be doing a coronary CTA? Well, you know, I mean, that's not going to give us the best morphology in the world, certainly not like the MRI, but obviously if we're doing CTA, this is coronary CTA, our cardiac CTA, and cardiac computed tomographic angiography. So we're looking at the coronary artery. So we want to know, does he have coronary artery disease? That would make a significant difference, both in operative risk as well as walking around risk, uh, with a 113 millimeter gradient and so we want to find out about his coronaries and this is an easy way to find that out so let's get those images up and take a look hang on so here we are you can see that he is an obese gentleman because you can see the graininess of his images and so there is quite a bit of subcutaneous fat when you go anteriorly and uh, the image is very grainy very noisy we wouldn't you can tell this was an image from that time because we wouldn't have such noisy images nowadays because we have computers that clean up the noise. And we had an iterative reconstruction, and now we have model-based iterative reconstruction. And so we can actually lower the KV. Usually people this size, we shoot them with 140 KV. We can lower the KV to 120 or maybe 100 KV and then clean up the noise with a computer for $250,000 called model-based iterative reconstruction are for $150,000 iterative reconstruction. And so you can see this is his aortic valve. It looks tricuspid. You can see a lot of calcium in the commissural line, especially right here. There's a lot of calcium over there. No wonder that many times when you're crossing the aortic valve and you can't get across and you're using a wire that you can get a little TIA because you knock a little piece of calcium off as you're hitting it with the wire, trying to get the wire across and then get the catheter across. Well, those are the days. And uh, these days we don't have to do that anymore. And so most people don't cross the aortic valve during cardiac cath of aortic stenosis trying to look at the coronary arteries. They won't cross the valve because of the risk of one clogging up the slit that's there and making the valve area even worse, which people then get syncope, not a very good experience in the cath lab to watch the pressure drop on somebody's aortic stenosis, or getting a TIA when the patient starts getting slurred speech while you're talking to them because you knocked off a little piece of this. And so people just don't cross it anymore. They used to cross it to get the gradient. That was the money. But now with the echocardiography, MRI, we've got everything we need. Well, you can certainly see that there's LVH here. It's a pretty thick little ventricle. We can go right into a ruler and uh, try to find whatever the point is. And we're getting down here 20.9. And we can come over here and try to figure out where our measurement is. And so it looks pretty significant to me. Concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. And we'll take this one and take this one back off again. And let's go look at the aortic valve right here. And this is during uh, diastole, but I can't make a lot out about how this valve looks in terms of being open or closed or whatever it is. Uh, 
and then we can look for ascending aneurysm of the aorta, which happens in people who have bicuspid aortic valves, where the ascending aorta is actually weak. And it's part of the same anomaly that occurs with a bicuspid aortic valve, bicuspid and then weak, uh, weak uh, ascending aorta that dilates and gets very big and requires aortic valve replacement as well as a decron graft. But we don't see that in this gentleman, so this is pretty clean. And then we does, do see his right coronary, and it is a dominant right coronary. And actually, dominant left coronary is more common in patients with aortic stenosis because it occurs with the bicuspid aortic valve. And so the origin of the right is a little smaller than the distal right, but uh, I don't think that's a deal breaker on this one. You can see the origin is a little smaller there. And then let's go to the left coronary. And the left coronary doesn't look very big either. Uh, perhaps we didn't give nitroglycerin in this patient when they did CTA. You can imagine giving nitroglycerin to somebody with a 113 millimeter gradient across their aortic valve. And so that might be a herring of experience as well. So these coronaries are not vasodilated. We didn't dare tempt this patient with nitroglycerin to see well, let's see what happens to them when we give them nitroglycerin, you know. And so you can see some calcium in the uh, circumflex coronary artery. We see some calcium out here in the left anterior descending. That's probably a diagonal. There's a left anterior descending continuing on. But we don't see any deal breakers in terms of severe coronary artery disease. And so that's a good thing. And so let's look at some more images which everyone's used to seeing this volume rendered image because it's so startling every time you look at it. We can trim this off a little bit as a purist. Having this hang on here makes it difficult to see the right coronary artery in the interventricular sulcus inferiorly. So let's just remove that. And let's go over here, turn this around. And there's the left anterior descending. There's a diagonal, there's a diagonal, a marginal vessel, small circumflex, big right coronary artery, posterior descending, posterior lateral branch. So this particular patient is not a bicuspid aortic valve, and it's not a dominant left circulation. And so let's take a look and see what these coronaries look like. So we'll do this. And then we'll do this. And uh, let's just take a look at the right first, since it's so big. And let's blow this up. Let's see what this looks like. And it looks like a nice, big right coronary artery. And it is smaller at the origin than uh, it is otherwise. And uh, you can turn that around a little bit and look at that. And you can actually. Find out how small it is by just taking something like this and moving it along down here. And then uh, we can take this little bar and call this normal. And then we've got this little bar, and we call this the desired spot of interest. And uh, we can move this little bar closer over here. There we go. So we got really got the coronary in there. And so we're getting a 54% diameter stenosis. And uh, and that basically is three-dimensional. That's three-dimensional. That's not just measuring across here. It's looking in all three dimensions when it does it. So it won't change any if I move this around. And so uh, there is some abnormality there. And then we're looking at the left hand here descending. And there's some little calcific areas. Here's one down here. You look overall, you know, there's a little narrowing up in here. The main left is not as big as you'd like to see it. But again, this is not vasodilated. This patient is not vasodilated. And so I really can't comment on all this stuff because we're used to seeing a vasodilated coronary artery tree, and we just couldn't do that in this patient. So, so let's get it over here, look at some cross-sectional pictures because they're color-coded and this is fun, fun to look at. And so they look pretty good. 
And so uh, let's take a look at a diagonal vessel. Here's the first diagonal. And then here's another diagonal. Look at that one. And they look pretty good. Come over here and look at this circ OM. Circ OM looks pretty good. So coronaries are not a deal breaker in this patient. Doesn't look like it's severe coronary artery disease. And uh, there's some things that don't look exactly right, but that's because I think of the absence of nitroglycerin. And then there's some calcification, and uh, the calcification is not obstructive. Uh, so we can come off of here. And uh, anything else anybody wants to know about uh, this particular case on the CT? CT looks good. A aortic valve is not going to tell us a lot. You know, just heavily calcified, and we sure don't want to cross it because we'll knock something up. But let's go over here and uh, take a look at our slides again. So we reached the point of tolerance for us where uh, we reached the point where we just can't stand to see this guy walking around with a 113 millimeter gradient across his aortic valve. And so we said, it's time to get surgery. Looks like it's time to get your aortic valve replaced. There is something we'd like to know about it. Let's go back to the CT for a minute, and we'll tell you something else. So let's uh, take one more look at this because we're interested in a lot more information than I do. And that is when we start when we started doing tabers, we got a greater interest in the aortic valve annulus. And uh, how big is that? And uh, taver analysis. We have a taver analysis on here, don't we? So we've got our taver analysis software loaded. And uh, we reprocess this with TAVR analysis. And now our question is, what do we need to know about this aortic annulus? What's the size of this annulus? What size valve is this going to accommodate? Where should we measure this? And so we do have standard ways of measuring this for TAVR. And the standard information that we've been using when TAVR first came out, which is percutaneous trans-aortic valve replacement, without surgery, it's percutaneous. When that first came out, uh, the FDA approved it with ECHO. ECHO was basically the approved method for evaluating, which was the stupidest thing ever. And so everyone had to go around and do ECHOs on them and then uh, secretly do a cardiac CT because the ECHO wasn't really valid and wasn't useful and wasn't helpful at all. And so we were all doing CT and we were doing echo because we had to do echo for the FDA. But nobody, nobody thought that that was going to help us determine what size annulus it was and how to, how to actually proceed with our TAVR. So the annulus isn't looking so bad here, but uh, this 23.7 is kind of suspicious. And so I'm not sure what's going to happen here, but he's going to have a really good valve surgeon because uh, he's a New Yorker. And uh, New Yorkers are not naive. And New Yorkers know where to go for everything. And so he's going to Cedar sinai to get this aortic valve replaced by David Adams' team, which uh, is, interestingly enough, uh, one of the teams that most active team in the country for doing TAVR. You know, but he's not going for a TAVR because he doesn't qualify. And it's uh, research. And he's a walkie-talkie, and they were just doing people who uh, were extremely high risk. But you can see this is uh, his aorta, and this is his aortic valve, and there's his aortic root. And uh, you can actually hollow it out, too. There's lots of things we can do to post-process that. And uh, we'll tell you more about what we're going to do on this gentleman in the future. So let's go back to our PowerPoint slides again. and. Uh, right here. And so he did have valve replacement and he had a mitro flow valve. Mitro. I don't know why they call it mitro because it's aortic. But it's a mitro flow valve, number 21, bovine, pericardial valve. And so it's hand stitched from a pericardium of a cow and uh, made to correspond to a valve and uh, with large orifice, I think it has a pretty good effective orifice. And so it looked like a pretty good choice. Kind of small, and so that'll be interesting because we all worry about patient prosthesis mismatch, and that's when your aortic valve is too small for you. 
And so you substitute severe aortic stenosis, you substitute a new aortic stenosis, which is prosthetic, mm -hmm. uh, usually moderate aortic stenosis. So you went from severe to moderate because you got a prosthetic valve that was too small. And so we have those every once in a while, and what they need to have is the Kono procedure, K-O-N-O, and that's a Japanese procedure where you split the aortic annulus uh, and then sew in a piece of pericardium and you make it bigger so it can take a size larger valve. These are usually size in odd numbers, so then that would go to a 23 if you did a Kono procedure. And so, but Kono is postgraduate, and uh, we see patients that uh, go to undergraduate surgeons and basically get aortic valve and it's a tissue of a patient prosthesis mismatch and they need a larger valve and then we have to send them somewhere else uh, to someone that can do the Kono procedure when they move to Florida. And so because uh, the aortic stenosis is, is still present, not as severe, the LVH won't go away and the symptoms won't go away until you have a valve that has an effective orifice. And so what to do next on this patient? Well, you come back and you've had surgery and usually we see people uh, very soon after surgery, we say, come on back and come see us the day you get back in town. Uh, because we want to find, we're doing your post-op care. And so many people are discharged from the hospital so early nowadays, you know, like robotic, they're going to get out of the hospital in three days or four days. And so we see people uh, that are just very close post-op that used to be hospitalized for a week and now they're not. So I consider they're Part of our care is almost the same thing we used to do as inpatients. And so a patient comes in, I see them the next, I see them the day they come home, we get a chest x-ray, an echocardiogram, we get uh, CBC and uh, electrolytes, we get the whole deal. And, uh, and we take a look and see, uh, just to take a look and see where everything looks like, EKG. And so here we go, patient is back home now, has a new valve, and so we've gone from 113 millimeter gradient to 25 millimeter gradient, so not not a zero gradient. It's not normal, uh, and uh, 25 is considered mild aortic stenosis. So a patient has mild aortic stenosis. That is both bovine aortic valve replacement, and everything looks great, ejection fraction, and so forth. So we're happy with what we found here. And uh, moving along, we've got aortic root 32.9, left atrium. We got all our measurements here. Ventricle looks great. Peach systolic gradient, 21.8. Mean gradient, left ventricular ejection fraction is fine. And we're getting left ventricular hypertrophy regression. And that's key to be getting the regression shows that the valve area is accommodating this ventricle and the ventricle is not pumping against the high resistance. Of course, if you still have hypertension, you still may be pumping against high resistance, but he's been treated for his hypertension. And so echocardiogram following Sequentially, mean gradient 18, really no significant change, no LVH. So that, that's, that basically tells us that we did a good job. Even though it seems to be a little bit of patient prosthesis mismatch, it doesn't seem to be significant in that we've got a posterior wall of 10.5 now. And so no LVH. So that's, that's the coup de grace that this has been successful surgery. And he's doing well. Of course, he still has some shortness of breath because he has the parasophageal hernia. And so now we're going along 2011, and we're following this ventricle, which looks real good. So it wasn't too late for the ventricle. It looks like the mean gradient is OK. The peak systolic gradient is, uh, is not bad. And so we're doing OK. Now, 2010, we didn't include those. We got a gradient 41, 42, and then 27. So but it looks like the valve area is getting smaller. So let's keep an eye on these numbers. And now the patient's getting a little shortness of breath on exertion, more than he used to get. Uh, but it feels good when he exercises. And uh, we're still following him with serial echoes. And they're getting 2005. And whoa, we've got our friend left ventricular hypertrophy is back. Uh, and peak systolic gradient is 72 millimeters of mercury. So we've got aortic stenosis again. So uh, what's going on here? So back on the treadmill, do a stress echo. That's certainly in somebody who has a parasophageal hernia and gets short of breath because of that. It seems like it's more objective data for us. 
And so let's take a look and see peak systolic gradient on exercise, following exercise, 102 millimeters of mercury. Well, I can't tell you what's, what's normal for that, but look, how long did he go? Well, uh, on this stress echo, he went less. He's going down to like seven minutes, six, seven minutes. So he did a little less on this. So I'm not happy about that, but he's a little older, and, but he's getting his LVH back. He's got the large parasophageal hernia, which measures peak expiratory flow, which is also down a little bit. But uh, that also is the code is certainly dependent on the patient and his effort and uh, his ability to do that test. And we did a CMR, which is exactly what Bob wanted to see. So hold on, Bob. We'll show you this. These are very pretty. And the echo window, as you know, is limited by you got parasternal short, parasternal long, apical, apical four chamber, two chamber, three chamber, and then substernal sort of subxiphoid imaging, and then occasionally you might go suprasternal and the suprasternal notch. And so those those are your windows. And so this guy's got a parasophageal hernia, you know, he's obese. And so there's sometimes uh, those options aren't enough options. But in terms of windows in cardiac MRI, we have infinite windows. We have all the windows you can want. And so we can do anything with this in terms of imaging. So this certainly, we always ask, we always get our echo techs to go show the MRI people uh, how to do the MRIs. And really, we actually, they can show them some things because they've been doing tricks for a long time. But also, you know, the collateral damage to that is to show the echo tech, you know, what they can learn from MRI. And uh, if they can't get a good echo, hey, no big deal. We do an MRI, so it's not a make or break uh, situation in terms of trying to get a good echo. And who needs to do a TE, a transceptual echo, which is invasive, if we can get these beautiful images? So it reserves the TE for only for endocarditis then, because uh, for aortic stenosis, you can't beat getting a, an MRI. And so let's look through this and see what we see. This is a dark blood study, and uh, we can see coronaries. These are coronaries. That looks like the LED going out there somewhere. The main left usually comes off over here. The right comes off up there somewhere. And there's the right coming off. And then uh, this is a black blood image, left atrium, four veins, as you see, coming off there, descending aorta, ascending aorta. Here's the right ventricle, right ventricular uh, right atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, ventricular thickness we can measure easily with a ruler, which is uh, comes up over here somewhere, and uh, looks pretty thick to me, you know. And so we got some thickness of 21. So we got the LVH is coming back, you know. No matter how we look at it, the LVH is coming back. And so black blood is kind of like a survey. And then uh, we've got stomach. Looks like stomach to me. We got stomach hanging around with the lungs. They become good buddies in this patient, so they're all hanging around together. And so uh, that looks like a lot of area that's taking up the stomach above the diaphragm. And so let's take a look and see what else we got. There's a nice one. Let's get this to move a little bit. I always like to see things moving. Radiologists don't like things to move. Cardiologists love things to move. You see it's squeezing very well, so we still got good left ventricular contractility. There's that aortic valve. You can get some idea of the, the black of uh, the turbulence going on there. But that's, uh, that's not really made for that particular information. But let's throw another one up here. And there's the mitral valve, which looks nice. Oh, now here's what we like. This is a good one showing the left ventricular outflow track, showing the aortic valve, showing the jet, the jet wow. across the aortic valve, and showing the contractility, and uh, showing how neat this surgery was, and how the continuity of the aorta, and it looks really pretty. Of course, we can measure everything that we do here can be measured. And so that's why it's not this test that takes so long, although the test sometimes takes long. Especially the outflow track, the right ventricle, pulmonary valve should be here. 
It's, it's not the test that pulled your artery. Not the test that takes so long. Many times it's the measurements that take so long. And so some of the measurements that we do have to do with measuring very similar to a Doppler or something we call phase. And all this stuff shows us where the aortic valve is, and it shows us what the velocity is across the aortic valve. And so we do a lot of this in a lot of different views. And it looks pretty funny if you're not used to seeing it, but we have anatomy, and now we have physiology. So anatomy and function together give us information about what's happening with this aortic valve. And there's the aortic valve. Doesn't that look pretty? You can see it open. We can actually measure the orifice there. So if you get right on FOSS with the aortic valve, you can do that. And so let's go over here and put a stop on it. And then let's show, sort of scroll through here. And there you go. There's the opening. And it's got opening here, and it's got opening here. And we can actually go around here, and we can measure that, and then we can calculate the aortic valve area. We can put spots, and we did that, you know. And uh, it's moderate, and so you can see how accurate information can be. And so we can go around and measure that whole thing, and we could uh, give you a valve area from planimetry. And so that's very, very nice picture. And there it is, closed. Very nice picture, open and closed. And so we've got several ways. The planimetry can give us the valve area. And also we get the valve here from the phase, looking at the velocity of it, just like we do in echocardiography. It's no different. Let's go back to it. So that's very useful. We got a lot of calculations after that. And we know that it's a significant uh, moderate aortic stenosis. So we got aortic valve area planimetry, 1.3. We got the continuity equation, which is the same as we use echo, 1.5. Pretty consistent. We got a peak aortic valve gradient here. 44 millimeters of mercury. The mean gradient is much more comparable when you compare mean gradients from different modalities as opposed to cardiac cath, echo, MRI. Looking at the peak gradient, it's better to look at the mean gradient. It's also better to look at the velocity. 3.3 meters per second is the velocity across this valve. So, and the large paraesophageal hernia, and the ejection fraction of 65%, and the left ventricular hypertrophy. So we got a lot of information on this gentleman and we're calling him moderate aortic stenosis, no intervention required, follow-up in six months. And so the next question is, what can we do in terms of interventions? And what kind of, what, what do we have to offer here? And so us TAVR people are very interested in that because can we do a TAVR on this gentleman and put a valve inside of a valve? Is there enough room? It's a 21 uh, bioprosthesis. And so those are questions that we have. We have an echo. We have a we have a CT. We're going to show you CT. Hang on. Of course, the CT is standard for TAVR. The MRI may be used for TAVR too, and there's some people that are doing that. But let's look at the CT. So this is a uh, multimedia, multimodality imaging conference. So uh, it's important to see the CT. Now, you realize that this gentleman had aortic valve replacement without having a cardiac cath. And uh, that was in when we did it back then, without a cardiac cath. And that was pre considered pretty new stuff. And nowadays, since we do TAVRs, we do all this. Everybody gets a CT if they're going to get a TAVR. And so basically, then we can do that and look at the coronaries. And again, uh, you don't have to have uh, cardiac catheterization. You don't have to cross the valve. Nobody does that anymore. And you don't have to have a cardiac cath. So we can look at the coronaries. Uh, we can see the right is not going to be seen very well because we've got some motion artifact over here. And so, but the LED looks like it's going to look pretty good. And the circ, which is minimal, is going to look pretty good too. But let's go over here and see what this valve looks like and see what we did here. Oh my goodness, look at the aortic stenosis. And uh, this is, let's go look and see which uh, image we have and make sure it's not a systolic image. So we're going to go over here and uh, see what we got here. And it doesn't tell exactly what image this is. And so it could be systole. So let's go back over and uh, let's post-process this in TAVR. 
and see what that does for us. It takes a minute to get our tabber post process. And so actually we have to have more volumes loaded for the tabber, it says here. So, so it's probably not going to do a tabber on us because we don't have enough volume loaded. Let's go back to coronary arteries then. And let's go over here. And let's go over here. And I suspect this is systole. Uh, and so it must be about a 40% phase. And of course, the, here's the big parasophageal hernia. And uh, let's go over here and take off the coronaries. Is that, that's not what we're here for. We're here. Here's our annulus. Oh, that's nice. And uh, there's the, the ring. Very bright. And there's the sending aorta. And then we can sort of triangulate this and see it in different views. Let's go over here. This is a good view. Let's put this up here so we can see it better. And so there we are. And so we decided that we were going to print this out, at least uh, pretend like it's a tavern. We didn't go into the lower part where we usually do iliacs, but we're going to pretend this is a tavern and we're going to study this. And so we need to know as much as we can possibly about if this is going to be a patient that's going to be reoperated. Do we have to do surgery, or can we do a TAVR on this one? And so actually, to do that, we're actually processing this into an STL. And when we get an STL package, then we're going to send that to Stratus to have a 3D print of this. And we're going to have a 3D print during systole as well as diastole. And then uh, with uh, the valve open and the valve closed, and we're going to study it more with the 3D image uh, that's a printed image uh, to see if we can figure out uh, what we can do with that and if we can do a tavern. And then we'll get David Adams online and we'll show this to David Adams uh, who is actually the principal investigator for the partner study and also the surgeon that did this aortic valve. So we'll find out more from that. But let me t show you a couple other things that may be interesting to you that are latest breaking news. Watchful waiting versus surgery. And so we just went through this long process of watchful waiting with this patient. And then we had surgery. And now it looks like we're seven or eight years later and we've got some prosthetic decline where the bioprosthesis appears to be breaking down and uh, becoming stenotic rather than becoming regurgitant. And we want to look at this and watchful waiting is actually not very productive when you get severe aortic stenosis and they're asymptomatic with four meters per second at peak velocity. This is uh, showing you what happened with early surgery versus watchful waiting over a two-year period. Wow. And so the asymptomatic patient. And so the mortality of the surgery, 15% mortality in that group. Our surgery here in Tampa used to be 5% when we were really good doing nonogenarians, octogenarians, we were doing like 5%. I don't know if that's true anymore because in those days there was only one or two surgery centers in like three counties. And so all the patients would funnel into a big center and you had big numbers. Now there are so many surgery centers that the pie has grown a little bit, but everyone gets a very thin slice of the pie and that doesn't lead to any people developing tremendous confidence doing uh, a couple of aortas a week, uh, especially in the 80-year-olds. And so you're not as good as you used to be if that's the situation. And so let's look at this. We get the mortality of watchful waiting, WW, 26.4% in two years. Uh, looks like we watched too long or we waited too long. And then congestive heart failure, 3.8%. And then the patient I saw yesterday who we're doing watchful waiting on, uh, who uh, basically is getting short of breath. And so congestive heart failure, 19.9%. So it doesn't look like watchful waiting is a very good idea anymore, especially since we have this capability with TAVR. And so let's look and see what is the capability of TAVR? How does it compare to surgery? Is it equal to surgery? Is it not inferior to the negative hypothesis, not inferior to? And here we go. This is the latest and greatest breaking news from the TCT uh, conference, and basically this is adjusted one-year outcomes comparing Sapien 3 
to uh, another group of patients that was partner 2A and uh, basically we've got the TAVR and we got surgery comparable groups and we can look at the matched analysis these are not randomized studies it's uh, analyzing two groups but it's using the latest and of course you know Europe has has the latest because Europe is like uh, one or two generations ahead of us in valves because uh, they're a little less stringent in terms of basically FDA type applied information and uh, basically regulations and so who would have ever thought Europe would have fewer regulations than we do but anyway they did have thalidomide and the consequences of thalidomide which we didn't in this country and uh, the Germans were really upset about that but look at this we've got TAVR 7.4 with surgery 13 percent so there's a difference of minus 5.2 percent with a p-value of 0 0.001 so wow we've got TAVR better than surgery that's the first time that's been shown a TAVR superiority to surgery in a group that are called intermediate risk intermediate being over 80 basically over 80 year old so instead of just doing high-risk patients which we've been doing up until now now we've got 80 year olds octogenarians many of them very functional and we've got this number and then look at stroke we got even though we're knocking around in the aorta and we've got wires and catheters moving around in there we've got less stroke than it takes to crunch the aorta with a clamp to cross clamp the aorta and then put a valve in so we got 4.6 versus 8.2 Aortic regurgitation, a little bit more aortic regurgitation because we basically smash the valve with a balloon and then put a new valve in. And this one, we didn't smash it with a balloon, we just replaced it. And so, wow, this is amazing. So, uh, this is the first time this, this has been shown, and it means that it's goodbye aortic valve surgery uh, unless you have an aortic aneurysm to go along with it. And someday we'll be putting endovascular grafts in percutaneously in the ascending aorta with the valve as well. So I wouldn't, you know, put my money on a loan to train to be a cardiovascular surgeon because uh, basically you're going to be an innocent bystander, you know, in the operating theater uh, watching people do percutaneous techniques or you better learn how to do that yourself. And so that is pretty much our story and of course you know there are guidelines for aortic stenosis these guidelines are going to be changing obviously these guidelines are going to change very rapidly they don't change as rapidly as you want to because you see they're in a book and so anything in a book is uh, going to be thrown away soon and uh, basically these are what they're doing in this book and uh, guidelines I've always preached that guidelines are not co costing casting concrete and I've always said that if guidelines are not a substitute for critical thinking and I think as we do more and more personalized medicine more and more personalized approaches to patients based on that unique presentation of anatomy and pathology and genetics that we're going to find that guidelines are going to be so uninteresting and so not supportive of what to do on a particular individual patient and so uh, so much for that so thank you very much for attending we're glad you could come and we're going to close out this conference now because we're uh, we're going a little bit over time and I hope you have a better understanding of aortic stenosis we're not going to leave it here you'll hear more about TAVR because TAVR is the name of the game now hope you all have a good day thank you thank you Eric <laughs>